Oh, wow. Here we are, guys. Hello, everyone. This is Father Sebastian for the Father Sebastian Vampire World YouTube channel, and I'm here with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, one of my great friends and co-conspirators in the paranormal world. So we have three viewers to start. So what have you been up to lately? I've been on the road, Sebastian. I just got back from Los Angeles where I had a whirlwind trip. I was doing the Conscious Life Expo out there, uh, and I've been there in the past. I do presentations, panels. I had several filming projects that I worked on, one on angels, uh, two on dreams, and one on changing consciousness and the new reality. And uh, now I'm working on new vampire projects. I'm going to be presenting on vampires this summer at a big paranormal conference. Which one? It's called Michigan Paracon. Okay. And it's in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. This is uh, a conference that's been going on for some years. It's a fabulous turnout. Mm -hmm. And they specifically asked me to present on vampires this year. I've been doing mm -hmm. a lot of research on ETs. Uh, working on uh, a documentary with a companion book on extraterrestrial encounters and experiences. And interestingly, did you know that there are vampire UFOs? No. Okay, let's tell, tell me about thing. this. Uh, there is such a thing documented, and I write about it in my book called Guide to the Dark Side of the Paranormal. They're called Chupa Chupas, and that's short for Chupacabra. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's been documented in Central America and South America. And these are UFOs okay. that appear in the sky as mysterious red lights or craft and they shoot beams of red light down on the earth that strike like animals or people. They're like laser beams, that's what they look like. If you have a laser pointer, then it would be like a gigantic version of that. And mysteriously then, the people become uh, wasted away. They uh, are found dead and exsanguinated as though all the blood has been taken from them. It's as though this cool. type of ET needs the blood of the living in order to do something for themselves, get energized. Chupa chupas. Chupa chupas. And they're and mainly in South America? Uh, we have not had any cases uh, notable uh, reported here in America. Uh, they have been documented for several decades now. And there was a r real wave of them back in uh, the 1970s and 80s. And a number of UFO researchers went down to South America to research and and uh, document these doctors were baffled uh, and uh, then it sort of tapered off and that's what we often see in the UFO arena that there okay. will be like a wave of activity and then then it shape shifts to something else but something out there appreciates the life force of human beings and also the animals on this planet and of course what's the best way to get the life force it's the blood well um the, uh, I never heard of a vampire UFO other than the movie Life Force. Do you remember that? With uh, uh, It was about the spaceship that came to Earth, and they sent a space shuttle up there uh, to encounter it, and it was like kind of like Lilith. And yes. The, the, and it was like the spaceship was on a comet. But that's the closest I've seen uh, to vampires. Similar idea, similar idea. And uh, we, we have other kinds of entities that are very predatory on human beings, and they take the life force in some way. The jinn will take the life force. And, really? Um, they will do it through bloodshed, through encouraging chaos and turmoil and human affairs. They also have very artful ways of terrifying people so they get that adrenaline energy that, that mm. pumps out, you know, in the life force. Do you think the jinn are causing all the chaos in the Middle East right now? They certainly are responsible for a lot of it, and many people from that part of the world who are very familiar with the tactics of the jinn will agree with that, that uh, the jinn enter into deals with human beings, like corrupt human beings who want power, uh, they want to foment war and trouble so that they can acquire power and manipulate others. Mm -hmm. And um, bloodshed, of course, they benefit from that because when blood is shed, uh, they can take that energy as well. And in ancient times, in that part of the world, the, uh, the jinn were... Um, Hold on a second. I'm not bored. I'm focusing. Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't interrupt. That's all right. But these He's guys not are, bored. I'm not bored. I'm learning about jinn and genies. The uh, people uh, used to make animal sacrifices to the jinn uh, in order to gain favor with the jinn. And, of course, ancient people did that to the gods. You know, we sacrificed living things to the gods so that we would gain their favor. So we have quite a bit of history of giving up our blood uh, f so that something else can benefit. Okay. Now, what, you know, blood sacrifice has gone back to various things. One of the confusions that I think a lot of people have is the difference between blood drinking and cannibalism, because it's pretty much cannibalism. You're consuming the light, the, not the, the spiritual energy, but you're, you're connecting to the spiritual through 
the physical and like for example what are the that cult in india that eats the corpses um there's a, a cult i forget what they're called there is a cult and i can't think of the name of it but uh, cannibalism practices are, are quite common around the world mm -hmm. and uh, part of it is um, one of the reasons why you would would be you would absorb the essence and the energy and the attributes of the person you are consuming correct and of course this was a practice in warfare where the enemy would be cannibalized as a way of conquering them and absorbing their strength and fierceness, intelligence, whatever uh, their good points were, mm -hmm. you would absorb that literally through their flesh and blood. So basically, the, it's kind of like, in a way, it's kind of like muscle memory. Or like, for example, you've heard stories, uh, this might be related of a guy getting a heart transplant, and he started getting into the very things that the guy that he got the heart from, like he, liked, he never liked cycling or um, hunting, and he started picking up the characteristics of the people who... Um, he got the heart the guy he got the heart from that's very well documented in the medical literature and why should we be astonished at this when people around the world have known this for centuries that if you take another body part or a substance uh, of somebody else's body into you you're going to acquire a lot more than just the fiber the muscle the tissue the blood and the fluids mm -hmm. you're going to acquire emotions attributes characteristics as well now back to the gin I have a question for you um, do you think that they're the same entities as they could? They could. Are they the, a different class of entity than aliens or um, uh, the Devi from India or maybe even gods? Maybe they're the same entities, just presenting themselves in a different way. Uh, well, to me, they are distinct, and okay. I think to most researchers, they are their own race, like we are our own race. But they are masterful shapeshifters, and I believe that they have the capability of taking on any form that we might give another name to, for example, if they wanted to hide. Their, their name means the hidden ones, and they, they like to move by stealth. They don't like people to know what they're doing. And so if they have the capability, for example, of looking like a demon or looking like an ET, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that they do that. And there is evidence, for example, that they participate in some of the ET abductions. Uh, and encounter experiences that they mingle around with the mysterious creatures that we encounter. Mm -hmm. They can masquerade as ghosts and, and even the human dead. And it would be for a variety of purposes. We have a, a natural well, human tendency. We have a question. Oh, okay. Um, Christy Beard. Um, so not all gin are bad. Not all gin are bad. They're very much like human beings. And uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have do-gooders. We have um, well-minded and well-intentioned people. We have bullies. We have thugs. We have criminals. We have terrorists. We have the mix. And so the jinn do, too. But it seems that most of our encounters with the jinn um, fall on the negative end of things. It seems like the, the more ambivalent, neutral, or even benevolent ones aren't all that interested in interacting with us. And the hostile ones see us as... Uh, entertainment or prey or, or some sort of advantage for themselves. So we're getting a, a very skewed perspec uh, perspective with our experiences. And now, are jinn related to fire? Is that the like? Their uh, according to lore, uh, they are composed of smokeless fire. The Quran says that they were created from smokeless fire. And in, in pre-Quranic uh, folk tales, they were the wind. They they rode the planet on the winds. So they they have no known form to us. Uh, they have said, and sorcerers who deal with the jinn say, that if we could see them in their true form, it would be too hideous for us to, to handle. We can think of maybe the most horrible demonic form we could imagine, and that okay. might be them. But uh, smoke, the smokeless fire aspect of it enables them to shapeshift into all of these various forms. So they're more they're energy beings? Um, in a way, I think they have their own tangibility and their own mm -hmm. environment. And if we were to go into the gin world, um, they might even look like they have solid form like us. But uh, I, it seems to be a lot more tenuous. You know, we don't have the ability to shape shift at will. Uh, there are people who do have ability to shape shift, but it's not a common characteristic among human beings to just uh, turn into something intangible. And uh, yet they have the ability to do that. They can do that in our environment as well as their own. Interesting. One of the things that I found very uh, curious is, um, are the jinn limited only to the Middle East? No, not at all. Uh, the jinn are everywhere. And even though most of the lore about them comes out of the Middle East, they have spread all over the planet. And I think that we have encountered them in uh, various guises. We've just called them something else. You know, we've adapted 
uh, our experiences with them do something that we've identified with our culture. There's a great deal of similarity, for example, between gin and fairies. And not all fairies are good. There are certainly uh, some very uh, hostile uh, fairies and fairy lore. Many of our ancestors in Celtic countries were quite terrified of them. And they share some of the same characteristics with jinn. Demons, beings that we label as demons, might very well be jinn. And uh, so there's a lot of blurring. Uh, uh, whenever we have encounters with uh, otherworldly beings, we're, we're going to fit them into uh, some sort of paradigm that makes sense to us. And that changes a bit over history. Okay. Because um, one of the things that a lot of people have asked me is why um, is the legacy onx blade curved? And it's because I, I lived in Dubai for a little while, and I've always been fascinated with 1001 Arabian Nights. And we actually have a small saber tooth community in Dubai, which is really cool. Uh, a couple dozen vampires hanging out in Dubai, and yes, they're Muslims. So um, the, uh, the curved blade came from my fascination with 1001 Arabian Nights, which is an incredible story. And uh, also Aladdin, the real Aladdin, not the Disney version. <laughs> And uh, genies uh, are not something that I'm an expert on. I mean, you're the proficient person on that. But it's uh, really cool to see and get a little bit more knowledge of something that has been a part of my childhood. And there, there is a vampiric aspect to them because um, they will take from the living and they like the life force and that comes through blood and through energy. Uh, when they decide to, for example, target a person and really pester them, mm -hmm. uh, they are capable of drawing off the life force the way a psychic vampire would, and, and then that person's health becomes uh, worse, starts to deteriorate, they have a mental oppression and confusion, there, there's a lot of um, uh, degrading of, of the quality of life, uh, as well as physical, mental, and emotional health. Okay. Um. Can you, okay. Now, do you guys have any questions for Rosemary on genies or anything, uh, Jin, or any of the subjects that you find interesting uh, in this discussion that if you've been following us? Um, uh, no, I don't do mustaches. Try it, not my thing. I like the uh, Amish look. Um, Are skinwalkers more powerful than jinn? You know, it could come down to a contest in that regard, contest of skill and ability. Uh, the skinwalkers are renowned for their powers of shape-shifting and Native American lore. These are sorcerers who have the ability to uh, take a variety of forms. The term has also been applied to entities, but it's really originally applied to, to sorcerers. And uh, the jinn world, uh, has many sorcerers uh, in countries all over the world who deal with the jinn, and it really takes a very formidable level of skill, uh, a certain kind of temperament and personality, because you're going up against um, some extremely powerful entities who have a lot of advantages over humans, even in our own environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be a real interesting contest, a one-on-one -on -one between uh, a skinwalker sorcerer and uh, the jinn. My money would go down on the jinn, frankly. You, what do you um, what do you see the future of? What are the jinn's intentions? Do they have a collective intention? Um, do they have an interest in? Uh, do they have an agenda? Um, like the uh, aliens? I'm, I'm trying to get an article up here for you. They they don't seem to have like a single unified agenda, and and we do have a tendency to project that onto whatever entities we're dealing with. You know, what are the ETs up to? Are they all this? Are they all that? Are they here to save us? Are they here to hurt us? We do the same thing with, with entities. And the jinn are as mixed in motive as human beings. Some of them seem to be interested in humans for their own entertainment, their own per personal purposes. Okay. Uh, they found like uh, an easy target that's advantageous to them. Uh, some of them are dealing with people because of curses that have been put on human beings, so they're doing a job. Uh, they're like a hitman. Uh, and uh, others uh, seem to have um, uh, quite a bit of malevolence toward human beings because they feel that we took their place on the planet and they would like to reclaim the earth. They would like to reclaim this dimension and uh, either get rid of humans or subjugate us in some way. So there are all these mixed motives going on and they can play out in many ways from uh, a personal uh, attachment with uh, some um, you know, poltergeist-like effects to wasting away uh, something that might follow families around. 
to uh, out and out assaults uh, on large numbers of people via manipulations with human beings. And I do think that they enter into uh, arrangements with corrupt human beings who have power, uh, who uh, then become engaged in a lot of the conflict that we see around the planet. I, I do believe that they play a role in that. I don't think that they're necessarily uh, responsible for it, but they certainly have a hand in it. Now, there's two questions here. Can we meet, can one meet or summon a jinn from Kristen, Kristen Benson? And then another question, are there five types of jinn or is there more than five? I've heard about maybe one or two, but not five. We can indeed summon uh, the jinn. Uh, we can summon many kinds of, of spirits. It's not something I recommend. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, websites on the internet, for example, that will uh, sell you uh, rings and bottles and whatnot that supposedly come with gin and it's supposed to be your personal servant and um, usually nothing has been attached to these objects and occasionally I hear from people who have acquired some sort of object that s is supposed to house a gin and then they wind up having a great deal of problems and the difficulty with uh, trying to summon a gin is it will always turn the tables on you. Um, they're always is, malevolent? Um, they're, I would say they're opportunists. Some of them are malevolent. Um, almost all of them that I hear about are opportunists. And uh, they will find ways to turn the tables on you so that um, they have the advantage over you. Uh, and it's not something for uh, novices to, to get involved in. Uh, I have too many horror stories. If you want to read horror stories, go to my website, jinnuniverse.com, D-J-I-N-N, universe.com, where people all over the world talk about the problems they had when they decided to try and traffic with the jinn. Um, it's not a one-way street. Uh, they cannot be summoned to just uh, do endless favors for us. They want something back, and um, it's usually something at a disadvantage to us. So it's... Are, are they related anywhere to the Lawa from Voodoo? Uh, you know, the lines get very blurry in terms of where something starts and another leaves off. And uh, I didn't examine the jinn from that perspective so much, but I did look at them from uh, a more Western perspective in terms of ancient aliens, the Nephilim, the ancient gods, uh, the Archons, the Anunnaki. And there are, are quite a few overlaps and similarities. So. Um, so they might be Anunnaki? Uh, they might. They would, they would certainly fit that profile because the Anunnaki came and, and used human beings. Uh, and um, I think Sitchin, uh, uh, Zechariah Sitchin documented that quite well um, about their interests in using human beings as a labor force. And that would be something that's not for gold. For gold. You know, and the jinn are energized by gold. One of the things that I found very interesting about the Anunnaki, and here's a theory that I'd like to present you, Rosemary is that the Anunnaki, they just proved that there's a 10th planet, even if you, well, ninth planet now, planet X, they finally got the math for the gravitational pull on the different planets, that there's an orbit of a planet that goes around every, Nibiru, if you want to call it, about mm -hmm. every 15,000 years, and it's an elliptical orbit outside, and they predicted that because of the gravitational pull, it's 10 times the size of Earth and potentially rocky. So um, if we want to look at uh, one of the things that I love is a YouTube channel called Vsauce. And they describe Vsauce 3 had a thing between paranormal and supernatural. Supernatural is outside the scientific realm, while supernatural or paranormal is unproven. There's scientific results, but there's no evidence of why those results are occurring, like dark matter. Mm -hmm. Another example, um, in believe it or not, in the 18th century, there were two things that didn't exist. Germs, which we saw results from them. Uh, until we could see them with proper microscopes, we didn't know they existed, but we saw the results of people getting sick. And the other, until 1821, is air did not exist. So those are paranormal examples of paranormal. So. Um, the human, uh, a lot of religious people and experts, uh, we, we see the phenomenon, we give it names, especially from historical references, but we are no, we are really advanced now compared to we mm -hmm. were in the 6th sixth, sixth century, you know, when they were writing de desert survival guides like the Bible and the Quran and the Torah, um, these were survival books uh, put in a religious authority so people would respond to them. 
but the mythology in them is based, we have a different interpretation of these things, and maybe we've closed our mind off to certain ideas and subjects. So what we call a jinn could definitely be an Anaki from Nabiru. Well, what, what, you, you raised some very good points there, uh, Sebastian. One of the things that um, the questions, the philosophical questions that I asked in the Jinn connection, the, the second book I did on the Jinn and comparing them to some of these other entities, is how do we know what we're really dealing with? Uh, mm -hmm. We um, we find certain enemies, uh, entities have the same characteristics from century to century, but we put different labels on them, uh, and. Uh, that sort of contains them in a way to a culture, and then uh, human beings uh, change, and we, we think that, oh well, that that entity just belongs to somewhere in the past, that culture in the past. When in fact, it probably is still around. It's just operating under a different name. Okay, very interesting. The um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take some more questions. I think we've uh, we've reached our twenty minute limit here. Um, so, Rosemary, thank you for coming. Let's take some more thank questions yes. and see stuff. We're, we're going to be doing something for my Huffington Post blog. Yes. Um, do not forget to subscribe to Rosemary's page on uh, Facebook. She started her own Facebook page and is getting that moving. So you guys need to subscribe. It's Rosemary Ellen Guiley author page on there. Yes, please do. Please come by and like my page. And that way we can get her likes up and everything like that so she can be validated and do live shows like I'm doing. The second thing, second thing that I want to be able to talk about is subscribe to my YouTube channel, Father Sebastian yes. at YouTube. Um, we're moving, we're going to be putting Vampire World there. It's going to be a show, a documentary series on the Vampire World. Uh, Rosemary will be involved in that project, but we can't tell you anything now because it's all in mysterious production. We you know, going through development. So check that out. Uh, in about three or four weeks, uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley will be presenting another co-authored article on the Huffington Post with me about... Weird Vampires from History. The weirdest of vampires. A very exciting article. And uh, this is from my research in vampire folklore. Do you want me to talk about a couple? Let's, let's just give a little s snappling because we don't want to give too much away. But um, end of March, early April should be the time because I'm putting together my schedule for the Huffington Post now. Remember, I'm on the Huffington Post, Father Sebastian, uh, HuffingtonPost.com slash Father dash Sebastian. Um, and this is my new job. So Rosemary is working with me on a couple projects. So why don't we talk about the top, like, not the top two, but like two examples of weird vampires. Well, these are vampires that really want something else besides your blood. And uh, there are the foot fetish vampires, for example. What? Yes. No. That they will vampirize you uh, from your life force. And in olden times, it was believed that they would literally suck your blood that way through your toes or through the soles of your feet. And in Middle Eastern lore, uh, the uh, foot licking vampire was uh, so feared in desert travels that. Uh, travelers would, when they slept um, out in the desert at night, they would ha have their feet touching each other so the foot fetish vampire could not get in between and take all the blood off from, uh, from the body through the soles of the feet. Then there are vampires from South America who um, want your body fat. They don't want your blood. Uh, you can keep your blood, but it's kind of like Fight Club vampires. <laughs> Fight Club vampires. They go to cosmetic surgery labs and they, the liposuction labs. And uh, here's one of the interesting things about the body fat. And, of course, if you, if you live in a very harsh climate up in the mountains and you have no body fat, well, you are in danger of dying. So you have been vampirized in a potentially fatal way. But there are some crazy folklore beliefs about what the vampires do with the excess body fat because they don't necessarily take it all. And uh, so there are stories about how they sell it abroad uh, to be used for airplane parts or uh, church bells. Um, just think, the next time you hear a church bell, is it made out of vampire, a vampirized human body fat? Where these beliefs come from about what they do with the excess body fat is uh, very interesting. Oh, communion wafers, that's another one, that the excess uh, fat off people is turned into communion wafers by the vampires. Well, that is a conspiracy that I have not heard of. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, uh, don't forget to subscribe to Rosemary's page. Uh, Father, click on the like button below. I'll put a link to my Father Sebastian YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very for much for watching Rock and Roll Vampire World. We have another video to make that will not be live um, about the top ten weird vampires. That's right. Check it out, Huffington Post. 
Rock and roll, guys. Be well. I'll see you next week on Vampire World.